My name is Robert Watt, and I will be your moderator for this session, in which we will try to answer questions such as, how can we stimulate the industrial decarbonisation and energy transition? How can industry enable the energy and climate transition of the whole of society? Our conversation comes at a critical moment. As the UN Secretary General said a couple of days ago at the launch of the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. To answer these questions and help us understand how the energy and industry transitions can live up to Antonio Guterres's call to action, I'm joined by three experts with a perfect combination of experience and expertise. First of all, Alma Pira Erdmann, who is Programme Officer for Chemicals Recycling at Borealis. Um, Alma has a fantastic motto, which is, when plastics from the beaches of Bali can be collected and recycled into new plastics, perhaps then I'll take a rest. I'd also like to introduce Johanna Mosbaj, who is Vice President, Biorefinery and Energy at RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden, and Adjunct Senior Lecturer at Luleå Techni Technical University. And lastly, Lars J. Nilsson, who is Professor of Environmental and Energy System Studies at Lund University, and also a lead author of IPCC Working Group 3. That's the one that looks into how we reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. A very warm welcome to all three of you. I'd like to turn first to Lars, um, and given the context of the launch of this IPCC synthesis report, which took place on Monday, this is really a significant milestone for climate science and for the evidence that underpins the energy and industry transitions. Uh, and you've been heavily involved in many of these reports over the years and they've been attempting to provide a summary of the best available science on, among other things, the decarbonisation of heavy industry. And I wonder whether you could just kick us off with some reflections on the synthesis report generally, and then perhaps what those main messages are relating to energy and industry transition specifically. Lars. Uh, Lars, you're on mute, I think. Sorry for that, I don't know how that happened. Uh, well, um, the emissions continue to increase. We still have to bend the curve, so to speak. Uh, but there are also some, some positive signs that uh, more and more countries are introducing uh, climate policies. We have a, a number of countries that uh, have reduced their emissions over long time periods, showing that it can be combined with a positive economic development. Uh, a big change or development since since the last report that came in in 2014 is or two things. One is that the uh, cost of renewable electricity has uh, decreased a lot. So that creates a lot of new opportunity. And the other thing is this mind shift from from uh, sort of marginal emission reductions that we talked about 10 years ago, reducing emissions by 20, 30, 40 percent. Now it's very clear that we have to go to zero emissions, and I think that, that that's a mind shift, and it's a mind shift that we're also now seeing, seeing in industry. Thanks very much, uh, Lars. Can I, can I follow that up a little bit and, 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 and just explore a little bit this idea of moving from thinking about gradual transitions to things that are much more uh, systemic in both the energy and the industry? Have you got some examples of, of where that's happening in, in both of those sectors? Well, in industry, we've had this uh, very exciting development about uh, hydrogen direct reduction for steel making, something that was uh, announced in, in 2016, uh, and it only took five years to build a pilot. Uh, many steel makers have followed. Uh, so it's, it's a rapid development, but it's also a, a situation where we need uh, industrial policies to, to uh, support and help and uh, share the risk with industry. 
And I think, as we will hear later, uh, the chemicals industry is also uh, jumping on this train towards zero emissions. Thank you very much, Lars. I think we're going to probably explore a little bit more about the interplay between the energy transition and the dependencies between energy and industry there. But you've set me up perfectly here to go over to, to, to uh, talk to Johanna a little bit. Uh, Johanna, your, your research has, among other things, identified the building blocks of the bioeconomy. So thinking very much in terms of, of perhaps uh, chemicals and, and other elements um, of the energy and industry transition. And, and you've been looking at what the business case is, what the, the broader benefits to society uh, will be. C can you summarise for us the crucial role that the bioeconomy plays in the energy and industry transition? Yes, thank you. And I would say, like, for me, the bioeconomy is really the economy that we will have in the future when we have a sustainable uh, system all in all, then we need to not use the fossil resources, but to re use the renewable resources. And biomass is a nice renewable resource since it has the carbon atom. As Lars mentioned, also renewable electricity is one key, uh, but we will also need the carbon atom. And for that, we need the bio-based and circular economy. So that is the future economy, so to say, when we have the total sustainability. And for industry, industry is key in this, not only because it's a large energy user, but also because in industry, we have both the energy demand, which we can partly use electricity for and renewable electricity, but we also have the feedstock flows that are fossil today. And here we need to replace those by renewable carbon in biomass or circular carbon from circularized, circular biomass or circular resources. So this will actually be, I would say that if we look into the future where we have a bioeconomy, we will have a totally new industrial sector, just like you, you talked to with Lars. It will not be just business as usual and little changes. It will be a need for something else. The industry sector will be, in a way, something totally different if we're going to replace all those, both feedstock flows and energy systems. Uh, and that is rather exciting when you have something new and how will that look and how will actors interplay and how can you draw uh, benefits from that? Because you can also be clear that this is not an easy transition. This is industry that is very capital intensive and thus it is really, really hard uh, to do the transition without a lot of access to capital. And that can be a barrier, but how can we overcome that and how can you get the actors to, to let's say, collaborate? And also just to mention, because that is a common question that you get when you say that biomass is key, that biomass is a limited resource. Uh, and that is very true. And that means that we need to work with uh, circularity, but also with resource efficiency. Uh, but we have a great potential already if we look into the biomass flows that we have today. If we take the forest industry in Sweden as an example, 50% of the carbon atoms from a harvested tree uh, will end up as carbon dioxide or any other waste or side streams. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of potential just utilizing the waste and side streams, including the carbon dioxide that is emitted, to drastically increase the utility that we get out from one harvested biomass resource. Can I, uh, I want to follow up on that last point about biomass being a scarce resource. And I wondered whether you could give us a sense of how we should prioritize the use of that scarce resource. Where do you think it's going to add the most value in this completely new set of value chains, bringing together new actors, but also a totally new sort of industry based on, 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 on the bioeconomy? I would say that that is a really tricky question to get the short answer on, because biomass is not one type of resource. It's a very different type of resource and depending on what biomass you have what you should use it for will be different if you have a tree of course you should use the best parts of that tree to build wooden houses because then you bind the co2 and it's a high value part but you can't build a house from the whole of the tree uh, so then you need to use each segment of the biomass for what it's suited for uh, if you have branches and tops that limits your use options and also the processes that can efficiently convert branches and tops. If you have sludge, uh, like municipal waste in biomass form, that also limits your uses. 
So what you should use biomass for really depends on what biomass do you have. Uh, because depending on the biomass, if it's uh, wet or if it's uh, dirty or if it's uh, really nice, uh, it has totally different use cases. Thank you very much, Johanna, for, for setting the scene on the bioeconomy. I'd really like to turn now to Alma. Um, and Alma, you're responsible for a project that provides a very practical solution uh, to part of this industry transition, which is the chemical recycling of plastics. Um, can you tell us what this actually means in practice? Yeah, I would love to. Um, so by recycling plastic chemically, you do break down the big polymers to smaller mole molecules. And what you do then is you purify it and, and then you put it back as a renewable, uh, sorry, recycled feedstock to the cracker, where you then produce ethylene, just like we do today. And then after that, you polymerize that to polyethylene, which is a plastic type, which could be used for cables, pipes, food packaging, because it's the same quality as virgin plastic as today. And uh, we're looking into building uh, one of these units in Stenungsund, and uh, we will hopefully soon start our uh, final study, which is the, the, the last study phase of three uh, very soon. And uh, hopefully we will have this plan up and running early 2026. And what it does is that it will uh, take the plastic waste that is today incinerated uh, to, to heat and energy, um, and we will use that plastic to produce new plastic instead of incinerating it. So what you're actually describing is very much this completely new type of industrial process, which is combining, if you like, elements of, of, of this circular economy with an, an industry transition as well. You've given us a date for when, when that uh, project, when, when the refinery, if you like, will be, will be there or the, uh, uh, the plant will be up and running. Um, what sort of volumes? I mean, how, how big is this going to be as, as part of the sector? And is it happening anywhere else or are you real pioneers at the moment? I would say we're quite early. Uh, there are a lot of uh, press releases uh, we've seen in the industry that are um, announcing that they will build these chemical recycling plants. Uh, but as of today, there is approximately 30,000 tons of pie oil in the European market. What we want to do is to take about 25,000 tons of plastic waste to convert it into pie oil. And I mean, these are still quite I would say small volumes because it is still a, an early phase and we need to find technologies to scale it up to really be able to recycle all plastic waste. Mm. But uh, this uh, technology, which is called uh, the pyrolysis technology, is the technology that has also developed um, the most. And there's a lot ongoing in, uh, in R&D, so I think there's more to come. Can we turn to a question that, that both Lars and Johanna mentioned, which is one around the cost, both in terms of investment, capital expenditure, but I'm actually also interested in hearing a little bit about the green premium that might be uh, associated with the process that you've described. So what, what sort of capital expenditure are, are we talking about for, for a plant of the sort that you're, you're describing? And, and what, if any, is the green premium of this sort of product? That's a hard question. <laughs> uh, but of course, there is a premium on the price, um, on, on the product price. Uh, but I cannot really go into details of that. And uh, I, I would say the range of an investment is a couple of hundred uh, million euros. Uh, but it also depends on what, what type of scale you're talking about and uh, the bigger it is the more expensive it will be it's yeah like for for every investment but um well we're working very very hard on that um i think uh, many many companies are now struggling with um, big investments um 
we have seen an increase in prices and uh, the situation in Europe now is not helping very much. It's also putting a pressure on investment. Thanks. Lars, I know you want to come in on this. Yeah, I think I, I wanted to add that I think uh, the, the petrochemical industry perhaps has the greatest challenge because if we look at green steel, it's not that far, it's not that much more expensive. But the petrochemical industry is is used to having relatively inexpensive fossil feedstock, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's more of a challenge there. But I also wanted to underline what Johanna hinted at uh, when talking about the bioeconomy, that it's, that it's, all, that it's really about uh, marrying the bio-based economy with the electricity-based economy mm -hmm. uh, and putting them together. And, and Johanna, what about, you also mentioned the point about the need to support sort of capital expenditure. Do you see a, a role for uh, governments uh, to play in actually providing that initial support to get things over a certain threshold? Yes, I think so. And we can say that if we look into the bioeconomy, and of course that goes into the process industries, because that's where we're going to play a large part of the bioeconomy in the future, we can see that there are those big thresholds. But we can also see that, of course, the fossil feedstock has been very cheap. But also if you look into the bioeconomy, most of these waste and side streams are also fairly cheap seen to the feedstock price. So it is the actual processes uh, and the capital costs that will be large. And hopefully that is only uh, a big uh, obstacle for the first plants. So there is a key role for, for policy and state to help those first large or larger investments in place so that you can test the technology, you can scale up, you can show that it works, and then you shouldn't need as much support for that. But it's also, given the structure of the industry, uh, the state and policy also have a role because there are really, due to the fact that it's so capital, the process industry, it's large players and it's large thresholds to get in. And if we look into new technologies and emerging processes and solutions, we have many small and medium-sized enterprises that are innovative and entrepreneurial, and they do not have a chance to get into those markets and scale up those processes. You need collaboration between the existing large incumbent actors and the emerging uh, innovative companies with maybe with new key technologies. And there you also need support to get that collaboration smooth and going, so to say, uh, so that you don't hinder uh, new entrants on the market. And we're, we're really only at the beginning, right, Johanna, of this mm -hmm. <clears throat> industrial transformation. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I think about bioenergy, we, we have a history of, of, of supporting mm -hmm. bioenergy for electricity, for heating, mm -hmm. for, for transport fuels. And now we also have to shift our attention to, to, the, uh, to industry. Yeah, to chemical building blocks yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> Yes, I get a real sense that we're, we're beginning to shift away from thinking about the, the bioeconomy and bioenergy as being another sort of form of, uh, uh, that, that we, of stuff that we burn, <laughs> more or less, to actually it being one of these, the, the green carbon that goes into mm -hmm. uh, processes of, of making these, uh, uh, these polymers that, that are so critical. Johanna. Yeah, and just to highlight what, what Lars already mentioned earlier, there is a really good marriage between renewable electricity and the bioeconomy, because if you want heat or electricity, uh, there are very many ways that you can get that with renewable electricity as well, not only biomass, but also if you put renewable electricity into bio-based processes, you can use more of the carbon atoms for the products. Uh, instead, you can use that as a part of an energy efficiency measure to add electricity to the processes, freeing part of the feedstock that was otherwise used for energy purposes in the process, making you have more or less a full uh, carbon conversion from feedstock to product. Uh, so it's really nice synergies between biomass and renewable electricity in many cases, not only for uh, utilizing the bio-based CO2 as an electrofuels or something like that this is rather low-hanging fruit, but other, also other combinations to increase efficiency.
Wonderful, yes. I'm hearing a lot of these things around combinations and uh, how the, they can bring about innovations and efficiencies. And I want to ask Alma, actually, because where your plant is located is, is something of an industrial innovation cluster. So perhaps you, could you reflect on the importance of bringing together these different actors um, in, in, uh, in, in the transition space? Well, I first want to start with looking at the, the circular economy of the plastic production. There is a need for, you know, a green electricity. We need more electricity. We need recycled feedstock. Uh, we also need to look at uh, how we design the plastic products. Uh, we need to work with uh, making our processes more efficient as they are. And we need more re renewable feedstock. Uh, we need to work across the whole supply chain. And the nice thing about it is that in Stenungsund, we have a cracker, which is kind of the heart in this industry symbiosis. Uh, so if we supply the cracker with uh, green feedstock or renewable feedstock or recycled feedstock, our customers also have the possibility to take advantage of that or or be able to we're able to supply them with uh, with this products as well so it's uh it's really nicely integrated and it's it comes with challenges of course um but i think this is a huge opportunity for the transformation because everyone can be a part of it so again, that goes a little bit back to Guterres saying that you know, it happens everywhere all at once, but everybody also has to be involved. And, and in a sense, you're describing something of a sort of mega test bed, which brings you closer to your value chain as well. And I wanted to turn to Johanna and talk a little bit about, we've heard a little bit about the importance of early stage government support to help those first of a kind plants uh, get built. And we've touched upon the need for other policies, and we're going to return to that. But the value chain, you know, ensuring that there's demand for these green products, these uh, green electrons and green carbon atoms. What's, what's the importance of the value chain? How can it be something of a, a pull factor to, to bringing about these, these transitions? I think that we have several examples in Sweden, actually, of how a good combined value chain can actually increase the speed to market. And I can say one, one such example is the example that you have with uh, Södra and Prim as different parts of the value chain when they jointly also with technology developers formed uh, the production for renewable tall oil diesel and Sunpine, the company. Uh, that was a value chain that was constructed by a forest owner in a mill where you had the feedstock and then you had the demand and market with the refinery. And then you also had a technology developer that was enabling uh, the new technology shift in between. But you needed the value chain to supply the feedstock and to have the market and to get the value chain going. That is one example. We also have other examples that are not as commercial yet, but you have the example of Cetra, which is a sawmill where you have the sawdust as a feedstock. You have a technology company uh, that comes in and you have pyrolysis of that and then you put that pyrolysis oil also for, for an end product as a fuel. Uh, and I think that to have both ends of a value chain and to get the collaboration going can speed up the process of getting to market because biomass is not uh, as simple as fossil feedstock to process. So it actually demands some knowledge and skill and competence of both feedstock handling but also feedstock processing and that is hard for a, a company used to fossil feedstock to get quickly so to say and on the other end it is hard for a company that is used to work with biomass and bio-based processes to get into the market of chemical products for example that is a quite special market if you compare it to if you're used to doing wooden houses or selling paper and stuff like that so it's it's different. So if you can combine and have both the feedstock side of a value chain and also the market side, and you can have those actors with those strengths in collaboration, uh, that has at least been proven, I think, to speed up your time to market. But then, of course, you can do it in other ways as well. But uh, we have some examples showing that it facilitates uh, at least a more swift 
uh, entry to a market with a new product. Lars. Lars, you're, you're muted, I think. That's weird. Is someone muting me? I haven't touched the microphone. I don't know what's going on. But I'd like to add on to this on the value chain thing. Um, one of the findings in the industry chapter in the IPCC report is that uh, demand side measures and material efficiency is, is quite unexplored. So, you know, we've had 40 years of energy efficiency policy, but we have basically no materials efficiency policy. And, and, uh, um, so that's an important aspect. And as you said, Alma, before before we started here, uh, you should have the right plastics in the right place, right? So we need to think of the demand side also. Th thanks very much, Lars. I actually wanted to talk about the sort of the value chain between industry and energy um, and talk a ask you a little bit about, uh, we've, talk we've had a lot of very good examples about how uh, these uh, these collaborations can really spur the change, but sometimes dependencies can work in an opposite direction. And I wonder whether you could just tell us a little bit about what the, the potential pitfalls are, or what the potential hindrances might be by the independent interdependence between the energy transition and industry decarbonisation. Lars. Well, uh, one challenge of course, if you look more globally, is, is that uh, uh, the sector, the electricity sector, needs to decarbonize. Green, ele green electricity that uh, that uh, industry can get, but I see a lot of uh, potential for synergies, because much of the industrial electricity demand will be for hydrogen. We see that with steel, and of course the uh, chemical industry needs a, no a lot of hydrogen. Uh, so this, this means that industry can be a really flexible off-taker of electricity and, and really help balance the grid. But thanks very much for that, Lars. Johanna, you raised your hand. Yes, uh, I was going to be able to say that less uh, optimistic. I, I agree with Lars, and there are many, many opportunities and said that collaboration in value chains is one. But if one is going to look into obstacles and barriers, as we were talking about, one challenge is actually that this transition, uh, if we look into, for example, the bio-based economy or utilizing CO2 emissions and so on, it's usually outside the scope of those large incumbent actors. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their core business, and that is by the logic of uh, an economy usually, that is prioritized, and you need to focus on that, you need to get that going, that's the highest priority, even though uh, transition is also important, but that is not, uh, at any given moment, it is it's not necessarily seen as equally important. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can lead actually to what you see that there is an, that you're hesitating. Uh, and that if you need to prioritize investment capital and so on, you might not go for the big new stuff, but you stick with what you're good at and you do more of that and you tweak and you turn. Uh, and maybe one example of that can be how we view the potential for CO2 capture in the bio-based CO2 in Sweden. If we look where we have the largest and most, most pure, most low-hanging fruit for CO2 capture, that is in the pulp and paper industry in Sweden. You have fairly large, you have the very largest flows, and it's also rather pure. So it's fairly easy to capture. But if you look into what actor is in the front line in Sweden for carbon capture from uh, industrial processes, that is Stockholm Mexico with heat and power plants. Uh, and that was, if you look into like the logic of uh, the engineering and the flows and the CO2, that is not the most uh, logic option. It should be a large pulp and paper plant. Uh, but then again, that's further away from the core business of the pulp and paper industry and more close to the core business of the heat and power plants. Uh, so of course, a transition and merging industries can also be a barrier and a challenge for industry because you're going into something something new and unfamiliar, and it's easier in every given moment to stick with what you know. Can I, can I ask you, uh, Johanna and mm -hmm. Alma, do you, see, do you see a role for new entrants uh, when it comes to, to your sector, so to speak? Uh, I always thought for steel that it would have to be 
incumbents that changed and reoriented. And then I was proven wrong when we got H2 Green Steel, which is a new entrant. Uh, how do you see that possibly evolving? I Go ahead, start. Johanna. <laughs> yeah, I can start. And I would say that my spontaneous answer would be like yours for the iron and steel industry, but then you have H2 Green Steel because it's so large capital investments. If you look into the chemical cluster in Stenusund that Alma is very familiar with or, or the refineries, you don't really build a new one, one would say. But then again, apparently you're willing to build a new <laughs> iron and steel plant, which is also a very big capital investment. Uh, so maybe, but then I think also that then it shows some kind of failure in the system because then you have let people be so hesitant uh, so that new entrants can see the opportunity to come in. I think that it must be also for capital resource efficiency to utilize the infrastructures that we already have. Uh, the what's say the backbone reply would be that that would be the most efficient solution. But if you have uh, what to say, if you have barriers to, to innovation or if you see that actors do not take the opportunities, then of course, after some time, that will leave the playing field more open for new, new entrants. But it is a challenge with the big capital investments. But I think that since you uh, H2 Green Steel is a nice example that I did not see coming. Um, mm -hmm. mm. Uh, what do you say, Alma? Do, do you also see some new entrants, some disruptive forces coming into the, the, the petrochemicals side of things. And by new entrants, do you mean like new business coming in, right? Yeah. It's, uh, I, I find it a little bit hard to, to answer, um, but I mean, w I think uh, with the pressure that is on now um, to really transform We've seen it, anything can happen. And we have a very ambitious strategy uh, for 2030, and that is to increase our production of uh, circular products uh, to 1.8 million tons from today's 100,000 tons. So we have a lot to do. And uh, I, I think we need to explore all the possibility there is. And at the same time, we will also uh, um, um, Base our, base our energy on 100% renewable energy. And I think, well, we still have a, a way to go. So uh, a lot can happen in that time. I'm glad you mentioned that basing things on 100% renewable energy, because I want to turn the question back on Lars. It was a great question, Lars, thank you. But I want to turn it back on you, Lars, because some of these industrial decarbonisation projects will rely on the availability of large quantities of reliable and relatively cheap renewable or clean electricity. Yeah. What effect might that have in terms of changing where things are produced and potentially changing the structures and enabling disruptive new entrants to come into um, the, the hard to abate sectors? Yeah, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of studies now showing that uh, you know, it would it would make sense to locate uh, very energy intensive industries in areas where you have uh, bountiful access to wind and solar. So people are looking at Australia, uh, parts of South America, but also northern Scandinavia with with good re wind resources, and and even. Uh, even now you could consider uh, having solar cells above the Arctic Circle, something that <laughs> maybe doesn't make sense uh, now because electricity demand is low in the summer. But if we have a lot of electricity intensive industries uh, with 24-7 with demand, we, we could have solar cells as well. And, and again, um, when the steel industry is looking at this, uh, they see land-based wind power as the first option and inexpensive option and design their processes so that they can they can produce hydrogen when the wind is blowing and then store it and, and have maybe one or two week hydrogen storage. We've talked quite a lot about um, <clears throat> the value chain, the interplay between energy and industry, the interplay between uh, clean electricity uh, and, and the, the bioeconomy, the circular economy. But we've also heard a little bit about hesitancies and hindrances to some of these transitions. 
And one of the areas that I thought we'd take some time to explore is, is, is in the policy space. And there's quite a lot happening. It's been a pretty hectic period um, over the last six months or so, with the adoption in the United States of the Inflation Reduction Act. And only last Thursday, the EU's sort of response to that uh, framework in the Net Zero Industry Act. And I just wonder whether there's been a lot of talk about these uh, almost like a sort of competition evol e e emerging in terms of policy for the, the decarbonisation of, of industries. And I wondered, Lash, do you see the Inflation Reduction Act as, as a spur or a threat to um, the energy and industry transitions in, in Europe? I see it mainly as a spur. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think there will be a balance between cooperation and competition, and we will we will have to see how that plays out. Uh, but it's not only the Inflation Reduction Act. We also have uh, initiatives in Japan, India, uh, the UK. So, uh, in a way, it's you know we're I think we're starting to see a, a, a green race, if you like, and. Uh, so I'm I'm hoping it will uh, it will accelerate. Uh, I saw a, a, a report just came out about the U.S. Inflation Reduc Reduction Act, a report from uh, National Re Renewable Energy Laboratory in the U.S. Uh, showing how this had made a huge impact on on the deployment rate of, of wind and and solar, and really shifting around the power system in the U.S. in in the next five to ten years. So it's it's going to have a big impact. Uh, the European initiative, Net Zero Industry Act, uh, still a bit unclear to me uh, how that will play out in more detail. Uh, it's different from the Amer the Americans are putting money on the table. Uh, uh, it, it's less clear in the European case um, how much money money there is and what kind of finance that will be right, redirected to these green investments. Thanks, Lars. Johanna, turning to you, whether you or not you want to reflect on this EU and US uh, uh, race to the top, hopefully, um, but, but perhaps more broadly around, you talked about hes you know, incumbents being hesitant and things not perhaps being uh, as fast as possible. What do you see as the critical sort of gaps in policy making that could be filled and could help us accelerate our transitions? First, I would just like, before I answer that question, just to fill in what Lars said, and I think it's great if we can have a race in sustainability of competing of who does the transition fastest, because climate really doesn't care if we do it in the States or if we do it in Sweden. It's just for our own economy and for innovation reasons and other reasons, but climate, and that we really care about where, where transition takes place. Uh, but otherwise, if we look into to the policy scheme and the landscape, I think that one, one thing that we try to highlight when we can in these discussions, as we said, the new industry, if you have the industry in a bioeconomy, it will be totally different than the industry sector today. And of course, that demands policy in a different way as well, because as you have it now, you have very different policies for forestry, for agriculture, for fishery and marine biomass, and for the industrial sector uh, that is not bio-based, so to say, today. You have very different policy settings, and you do not necessarily have collaboration and integration between these policy landscapes. So one challenge is the need for increased policy coordination, because you can't have policy that is applied differently to the same thing depending on what type of actor you are from the beginning. If you want to do the same thing or if you want to act in the same field, or then the same policy, of course, should apply. But today we have, uh, of course, by history, uh, divergent policy landscape, and we need more policy coordination in order to speed up transition and maybe also to take away uh, hindering uh, policy in some parts. Mm -hmm. But I think that last might be better to, to answer that question. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, industry is a hard nut to crack, also because we have international competition. So you have to, you have to sort of ba balance between whip and carrot, and also thinking about carbon border adjustment mechanisms, as we're we're talking uh, about in Europe. And the idea of uh, net zero 
fossil free industry is is quite new so i think there's a lot of uh, need for policy learning and and capacity building when it comes to to governing this transition from from the point of view of governments and again um there's a gap definitely when it comes to understanding uh demand management and materials efficiency it we, we tend to focus on the supply side when when we're looking uh at industry alma are there particular policies that you feel would really help borealis achieve its goals when it comes to you know, increasing that huge amount of production from where you are now to those millions of tons in the in the future well i think uh, one of them the packaging and waste directive which uh which has a um a goal of having 30% or not even a goal of mandatory recycle content of 30% by 2030 uh, is a really good one because that will uh, create a demand for recycled plastic. And I think that's great. Uh, but I also think it's important that we have uh, legislation that also supports and drives um, new technology development. Mm. And that's, that doesn't hinder us. So it's... Um, yeah, and I think it's also a hard balance. Yeah, I, find out. I, can, I could I could underline that Alma that that uh, you know, generally uh, industry prefers certainty, right? <laughs> and 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 yeah. not not uncertainty and risk. So it, it's about de-risking mm. investments for industry. Yes. Brilliant. Look, we're running out of our time um, now, but I, I want to give each of you. One question, it's the same question, and you'll have about 30 seconds to answer it. Um, in September, the UN Secretary General is convening a Climate Ambition Summit, and it'll be attended by leaders from countries and companies, indigenous peoples, academics, civil society. I want to know, if you had 30 seconds in a lift, in an elevator with Antonio Guterres, what advice would you give him about the outcomes that he should be seeking from this summit and i'm going to start with johanna please what would you say then i would ask him to be patient and brave uh, and to say that when you do the transition and the fossil will cost it will hurt a bit but we need to go through it and i will i, I would ask him to please be both patient and brave alma <laughs> uh... I have no idea. I would probably be starstruck, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm getting very uh, impatient. So I would just say, come on, let's go. Uh, that's uh, that's my feeling right now. Thanks. Lars? Mm -hmm. well, my, my first thought was to pray for a miracle. Uh, but I think... Uh, one thing I would talk about would be, and, and that's happening already, I mean, we're going from a situation where the transition or climate mitigation was talked about in terms of being a burden, it's a cost, etc. But with all the technology development and the thinking about socio-technical system transitions, I would, I would talk to him about uh, having uh, positive future visions that uh, the uh, climate neutral society is something really nice to live in and and not involving a lot of burdens and yeah thank you very much so we need this aspirational vision of the transformation yes there'll be tough decisions and it might cost a bit more as, as johanna has said but it's something that is 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 very attractive uh, yeah. for us I think the main the main barrier, in a way, is uh, fossil fuel interests because there are incredible value in fossil fuel assets and a, a lot of political economic interest to keep using them. That that's the biggest barrier today. And it'll be really put to the test when uh, many of these leaders gather at COP28 in the United Arab Emirates, uh, which is. You know, in a region which is very dependent still and has been on on the the fossil fuel uh, uh, miracle, if you like, um, economically speaking. So that will certainly be something that I think the world's eyes will be turning towards in December of this year. 
Um, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you very much, all three of you. Uh, Johanna Mosberg, uh, Alma um, uh, Pierre Erdmann, and Lars J. Nilsson. I've also learned a, a new sort of hand signal, which I think rather summarizes many of the things we talked about, which is to, to sort of connect your fingers together here to, into, uh, to show the need for collaboration, collaboration along value chains, collaboration between the energy and industry sectors. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.